the past, present, and future of work. I mean, this is a topic a lot of you are probably uh, hearing about. I mean, how many of you are reading about or you're seeing on television this idea of the robots are coming to take it up? Put your hand up if you've kind of seen or read about uh, something like that in the past few months or uh, the past year or so. I mean, that's something we've been doing a lot of thinking about at Moen. We've been working with governments in Canada uh, and other countries to think about what are the impacts of technology on the world of work. So for workers, uh, for governments, for firms, uh, for universities, kind of across the board, what will all these changes mean for uh, a variety of actors in our society? Uh, so in terms of the talk today, there's really four things uh, I wanted to um, touch on. So number one is, what are some of the longer term labor market trends that it's worth uh, being aware of? Uh, so I'll spend a few minutes on that. Um, then maybe five or six minutes on this notion of uh, the digital economy. What's changing in the world? What are all these new technologies that everybody's talking about? What are they going to do to some of those longer term uh, trends? And then maybe give you some observation about what this all means for jobs and skills in Canada. So what will the future of jobs and skills look like? Uh, and then finally some potential policy responses. So for governments, for business, for individuals, for communities, what can they do what can you do to prepare for and adapt to this changing um, dynamic? In terms of those longer term trends in the labor market, uh, there's really three that I want to draw your um, attention to. So first is this notion of unequal prosperity. Second is the rise of so-called precarious work. Uh, then the third one I'll touch on briefly is the decline of unionization uh, in Canada and other advanced uh, unequal prosperity. This is a little bit of a messy graph, I apologize for that. Uh, but this shows you the so-called Gini coefficient. So this is a measure of how unequal a society is. The closer to one, the closer to the top of the chart that, uh, that the line gets to, that means that essentially one person in a society has all the wealth and everybody else has nothing. If the line is closer to the bottom or zero, that means uh, we have completely equal uh, distribution of um, wealth and income uh, across the country. So in Canada, we're not, not terrible. I mean, there are other countries that are worse than us in terms of income inequality, like our neighbors to the south, uh, but there are other countries which are much better uh, off than us, or kind of more, more equal. So especially the Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, uh, and the like. And what you'll see from the lines is that Canada's income inequality hasn't really gotten worse or better in the last 15 years or so. So we're kind of at the same level we were in about 2000, 2003. Uh, the question becomes though, uh, what's going to happen going forward? And are some of the trends we're about to talk about uh, potentially going to make income inequality spike even further um, going forward? So I mean, this chart shows you more kind of at the worker level, what does that idea of income inequality for a lot of workers. I mean, this chart shows you from 1961 to 2013, real wage growth for the average worker in Canada. So you can see from 1961 till about the late 70s, early 80s, there was really steady, sustained wage growth for people in Canada. So as the economy was growing by 3, 4, 5, 6% a year, people's wages were going up by 3, 4, 5, 6% Year. Since the early 80s, we've hit this kind of trough or plateau where people's wages aren't going uh, up as the economy continues to um, grow. Uh, and some uh, economists in the US have referred to this as the great decoupling. So the economy is growing, uh, and historically, when the economy was growing, people's wages were growing in lockstep with the economy. But we're now in a new phase where the economy is growing, but workers' wages are very stagnant. Uh, and if you look at the numbers in Ontario, for example, uh, so between 1997 and 2016, so a 20 year period, uh, if you're a non-management, non-professional worker in Ontario, so you can imagine that's many, many people in the labor market, your wages were essentially flat uh, when adjusted for inflation. So for 20 years, your wages really did not go up. Um, and you can imagine, obviously, at that same time, your housing costs went up, your energy costs have gone up, your childcare costs have gone up, your food costs have gone up. So when we start thinking about, well, why are these kind of populist governments taking root in places like the United States, I mean, arguably even here in Ontario now, uh, 
some people would argue that that's because the average working person uh, is getting disillusioned with government. Governments are telling them, hey, things are going well, the economy is doing well, we're, we haven't had a recession in 10 years, but the average worker is looking at their paycheck at the end of the month and saying, well, I'm making exactly what I made 10, 12, 15 years ago, I'm working harder than ever, and I'm not getting any further ahead. In fact, I'm slipping behind when we think about my ability to buy a house or uh, have kids and have them taken care of in a safe uh, way, for example. Um, and even those average numbers, I mean, I just kind of showed you this chart, wage growth is kind of stagnant, but when we even look a layer beneath that, the picture is probably even more troubling. So what this chart shows you, it takes a, it's kind of 20 seconds of explanation, but this shows you the difference in average incomes for non-senior households in Canada between 1977-78 and 2011 uh, or sorry, 2012-13, so about a 30-year period. So it shows you the percentage change in incomes for different uh, family uh, households. And it's divided based on income decile. So the very far left uh, bar, those are the bottom 10% of income earners in Ontario and Canada. Far right are the top 10%. And kind of going along the line, those are different 10% slices of households in Canada. Uh, which is the darker blue line in Ontario, which is the lighter green line. So essentially what this shows you is over that 30-year period from the late 70s to the early part of this decade, if you're at the bottom 10, 20, 30%, you're actually falling behind in terms of household income. So forget about stagnation, you're actually dropping further and further behind uh, when we think about your relative position uh, with regards to income. The top 10, 20, 30% are doing very well, especially the top 10, and you can see their gains over that period are about 40% uh, in terms of income. So when you hear people talk about the top 1%, the top 10% getting outside shares of uh, wealth and income gains, this chart kind of gives you that exact um, story. So again, kind of the average tells you one thing, but when you start peeling beneath the average numbers, you start seeing very different stories for different segments of the population. I mean, this is very consistent with what we see in other uh, advanced economies. I mean, this chart shows you kind of the very slow, steady decline uh, of gross domestic products, so economic prosperity in the country that is going to labor, so in form of wages and compensation to workers. Where is it going? Instead of to wages, it's going to corporate profits. So if I had a line showing corporate profits, they would be going up steadily as labor share of uh, GDP is going. Uh, down. And again, there are a whole host of potential reasons for this. We can talk about some of those uh, in a couple of minutes, potentially. Uh, then the second key longer-term trend I want to draw your attention to is this notion of uh, precarious work. So historically, in the kind of post-World War II period, um, we had what we called in Canada the standard employment relationship. So if you had a job, and usually you were a man in that situation in the 40s, 50s, 60s, I mean, women's labor force participation was much lower at that time, you generally had a permanent full-time position that would come with benefits and some kind of a pension plan from your employer. Public supports like Canada Pension Plan, Medicare, were really intended to kind of fill in the gaps that the private system did not uh, provide um, for people. But what we're starting to see increasingly in the last 20 or 30 years is fewer and fewer people uh, are engaged in that so-called standard employment relationship. More people are engaged in part-time work, temporary work, they're self-employed with no uh, employees. Sometimes that can be a good thing. I mean, you can think about there are some people who are independent contractors who maybe work in computers or kind of software who make lots of money. They may make two, three hundred thousand dollars a year as an independent consultant. Uh, but for a lot of people, this is not a good thing. I mean, generally speaking, at kind of an average level, the quality of the jobs that people are able to obtain in Canada is slowly uh, declining. Uh, and increasingly, people are, have fewer access to the benefits and the pensions that a full-time permanent job would um, afford them. So I mean, this chart kind of gives you a sense of that. So on the left side, uh, this is access to employer benefits, so things like medical insurance, dental coverage, employer pension. The, the taller bar in all cases on the left, those are folks in standard employment relationships, so the people in full-time permanent positions. The shorter bar, are the folks in non-standard positions. So you can see there's a huge gap 
if you're in a standard position, much more likely to have all those extended benefits uh, and pensions. The chart on the right shows you the median wage. On average, standard employment um, folks have a $25 an hour wage, non-standard 15. And again, some non-standard folks make a lot of money, some standard uh, employment folks don't make so much money. But on average, you'd much rather, kind of given your choice, be in a standard employment relationship uh, than not. Uh, then the third point, I just touch on this one relatively briefly, is this idea of declining unionization. So I mean, if we're facing a labor market where people are struggling to make good wages, uh, the quality of their jobs is declining, what avenues do they have to advocate with their employers for better working conditions, better benefits, better wages? By and large, it's going to be hard for an individual usually to negotiate for that on their own. I mean, having union representation, having others on your side will generally make it easier to uh, advocate for those kind of uh, better wages, better, safer workplaces. So we know that unionization rate in Canada is in a slow, steady state of decline. So it was almost 40% in the early 80s, now we're under 30 percent. In the private sector, we're at about 15 or 16 percent. The public sector unionization rate is much higher, so government workers, broader public sector um, workers. Uh, so those are the longer term trends. Now I want to just pivot quickly to the digital uh, side of this. So this is kind of where all the hype in the media is, what you're seeing all the headlines about, the robots are coming, artificial intelligence is going to destroy all the jobs we have in Canada, so on, so on, and so forth. Um, so I want to touch on a couple of things here just to kind of um, highlight things I think are important in this uh, regard. So what is the unique nature of digital firms um, these days? So if you think about a kind of a large company in the 1960s, 1970s, what did it traditionally look like? It was probably a place with a significant physical footprint. It was a large plant, maybe multiple shifts running throughout the day if it was like a car assembly plant or something like that. And you know, tens of thousands of workers potentially cycling in and out of that uh, plant. And lots of um, kind of raw materials being used at that plant to produce cars or uh, furniture or whatever, whatever else they were uh, making. What we're seeing in the digital economy today uh, is very small uh, physical infrastructure footprints are required by these firms. They don't need huge plants. They don't need thousands and thousands of workers. In some cases, I mean, uh, is anybody familiar with WhatsApp, the messaging app? So it's on your phone, you kind of message uh, your friends and family. That company was bought by Facebook a few years ago for over $20 billion, and there were 40 or 50 employees working for that company uh, at the time. So not even kind of like one side of this room was the entire kind of WhatsApp uh, employees. Unfortunately, I'm pointing to you, you don't have $20 billion on this <laughs> That. But I mean, the other piece we need to think about is the low cost of replication. To make a car, you need steel, you need rubber, you need all these inputs, and you need them for every single car. Once I've got a really good digital service or product, I just have to build it once, and then I can sell it millions and millions of times around the world without having to spend lots and lots of money to create that same uh, digital file or digital service. So you imagine like a, a music album you like. Historically, record albums would have to print those, they had uh, warehouses making them, storing them, sending them out to music stores. Now, a musician anywhere in the world could create an album online, and billions of people could theoretically download that at the cost of kind of electricity and just uh, an internet um, connection. And then the third important point I just kind of want to draw your attention to is this idea of network effects. So the idea behind this is that the more people that are on these platforms, like Amazon and Google and Facebook, the more valuable those platforms become to everybody else. So I mean, if you imagine, let's say that you, for example, are not on any social uh, networking sites, so you want to get in touch with old friends and family from around the world. Where are you going to go to do that? You're probably going to go to Facebook, because that's, in all likelihood, where your friends and family are. You're not going to go to the 10th or 15th or 20th ranked social media uh, or kind of social networking site, because nobody is going to be on um, the site. So, I mean, that's a good thing at one, on, one, on the one hand, because I mean, it means that all of us in the world can connect on one or two sites. But if we think about competition for Facebook, how can I, how can I theoretically start up a competitor 
to Facebook when everybody in the world is already on Facebook. I mean, the costs of me kind of getting a share of that market are incredibly high. Uh, and the danger of that, obviously, is that the more power a company like Facebook or Amazon has, they can squeeze out competitors and gradually maybe start uh, kind of shaping the discourse in terms of elections or raising costs on retail goods in the case of Amazon. And there's nobody there to compete with them in the long run. So this is something governments are starting to get concerned with. How do we have fair competition in a digital world where, in a lot of cases, uh, these digital firms are kind of winner take all. Once you've got a good app for retail, it's really hard to have 10 or 12 good apps because it's kind of like a um, concentration of eyeballs and resources going to the one, uh, the one platform. Uh, so I mean, to the point I was making about the number of workers, I mean, if you look at AT&T 50 years ago, uh, in the US, the most valuable company in the country, they had 750,000 uh, employees in the mid-1960s. Today, companies like Google, Apple, and Facebook, we're talking 50, 60, 70,000 employees. So again, hugely valuable. A couple of these firms are kind of flirting with being tr worth a trillion dollars. They're not, they don't have many employees to spread that wealth around which, I mean, again, the top 1%, top 5% are going to do very well in this world. What happens to everybody uh, else as more and more wealth concentrates in fewer and fewer uh, hands? And if we look at the stock market, for example, as a sign of where the world is going, um, on the right side, we see from about 12 years ago, uh, what were the top five most valuable firms uh, by stock market valuation? Exxon, General Electric, British Petroleum, Citigroup's kind of financial services, resources, and the like. If we look at today or a year ago, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, all digital firms. If you extend that down to the top 20, 12 or 13 of the top 20 are all uh, digital firms. A company like Amazon now controls almost half of the e-commerce uh, market in the United uh, States. Uh, so this chart is probably the most important one or most interesting one in the whole presentation. This gets to the notion of artificial intelligence and automation. So what this chart shows you is the United States job market from 1983 on the far left all the way up to 2014. So about a 30 year period. The story in, the, in Canada, by the way, is pretty much exactly the same, but uh, just kind of easier to generate the US data for this. Chart. So it's a little hard to see, but I'll explain to you. There's four lines on this chart. Basically, this divides the US job market into four types of jobs. So you can see the very top red line has almost doubled in terms of the quantity of jobs um, that it represents. And those are the non-routine cognitive jobs in society. So somebody who uses their mind for a living, uh, and what they do changes on an hour-to-hour, day-to-day, minute-to-minute. Uh, basis. So you can think of maybe like an engineer, an architect, I mean they're always doing different things, they're using their mind and creating blueprints for buildings or designing buildings or a policy advisor in government, what they do is always changing and evolving. Uh, the bottom gray line, which is also seen by about a 60 or 70 percent growth in the number of jobs, those are non-routine manual jobs. So I'm using my hands for a living, but what I do changes day to day, hour to hour. So I mean, we had a plug sink in our house yesterday. I was like, oh, oh we got to call a plumber, and that's probably going to cost us four hundred dollars just for the guy to walk in uh, the door. But I mean, he came into our house. He was trying to look at our dishwasher, a plug sink. After that, he might be going to uh, a small convenience store to figure out some pipe issue they've got, or install a toilet, or do something. Uh, so he. Using his hands for a living, but what he does changes task to task, job to job. And he's not really kind of sitting at a desk doing exactly the same thing over and over again. So, again, key in those bottom line and the top line, what's the common denominator? It's non routine. It doesn't matter if you're using your head or your hands, but what you're doing is changing, it's dynamic, it's kind of a fluid uh, job description. The middle two lines, though, those are the routine jobs in our society. So routine manual and routine cognitive jobs. So a routine manual job, that's pretty easy to think about. Uh, maybe a forklift driver who's taking boxes from one side of a warehouse to another. Uh, somebody on an auto assembly line who's bolting the door to the car uh, body doing the exact same thing over and over and over again. Guess what? Robots can do that far cheaper and far more effectively. They're never going to get sick. 
Once you've paid off the costs of the robot after two or three years, you basically have free labor other than maintenance um, for the robot. And we know that that's happening in auto assembly, for example. We have the same number of cars being built in Ontario today as we did 15 years ago, but with 30% fewer workers because there are a lot of advanced robotics and machines in those plants. Uh, what's a routine cognitive job? So it might be uh, a telemarket. You don't need a person making that phone call to people, and we already have the technology now. And some companies have developed technology where the computer software can call up a restaurant and make a reservation on your behalf. But because the companies know that restaurants don't want to give reservations to computers, they make the computer's voice cough and kind of stutter and sound like a person. So I mean, that's kind of how smart the tech firms are. They're having computers mimic how humans speak and how we uh, behave. So I mean, those are kind of the routine uh, cognitive jobs, like a telemarketer, maybe an administrative assistant in an office whose job is like scheduling meetings all day long. Technology can do those jobs now, and if we project forward, guess what? Te technology will just get better and better at consuming and taking over routine um, jobs. So if you're advising your kids or your grandparents or your grandkids, what type of career should you get into? The key focus should be get into something that is changing and always dynamic. Do not get into a field where you're doing the same thing over and over uh, again. Lots of studies on this automation question. So artificial intelligence, advanced robotics, how will they impact uh, quantity of jobs in a country like Canada going forward? So I mean, some of the studies put out by large, very reputable organizations like the OECD or World Bank are as low as 5 or 7% of existing jobs could get eliminated. Some studies are all the way up to 40, 45% of existing jobs can be eliminated over usually kind of a 10 to 20 year Time frame. And again, this is not unusual. There are always jobs in society that don't exist anymore at a certain uh, point. So like washerwomen from the 1920s, there were lots of them in countries like Canada and Britain. Once the electric washing machine came, into, came on the scene, we didn't need people to kind of manually wash our clothes uh, anymore. There were people, I think they were called knocker-uppers in Victorian England. So all the warehouse workers sleeping in their kind of rooming houses, guys would walk around with a long wooden stick, knock on the windows to wake them up uh, and make sure they got to their shift on time. With alarm clocks, we don't need those jobs anymore. I mean, this has always happened. We always create and destroy jobs. 30 years ago, nobody would have predicted we have so many jobs related to computer software uh, or the digital world, for example. The difference is, uh, usually we wouldn't see 40 or 50% of jobs that exist today being eliminated within a 10 or 20 year horizon. Usually a much smaller number. So the possibility is that we'll have a much bigger disruption going forward than we're traditionally uh, have been used to, or at least other than kind of big inflection points in history like the Industrial uh, Revolution. So I mean, we have a couple of historical parallels to look at, but other than that, generally speaking, it's more of a kind of quiet churn rather than huge disruptive uh, changes. Uh, so who's most vulnerable to these trends in terms of automation, losing your jobs? I mean, generally speaking, and this is kind of logical given what I was talking about in terms of routine jobs, non-routine jobs, uh, folks who are making under $15 an hour, so on the far left, they've got probably about a 78% chance of their jobs being automated uh, in the near to medium future. If you're making over $30 an hour, on the far right, uh, you're only at about a 44% chance. And I mean, that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, if we think about who makes more money in society now, it's generally people with the non-routine type of jobs, less susceptible to automation. Uh, if you're a cashier making minimum wage, you've already got self-checkout lanes, you've already got this technology that exists today that could theoretically eliminate your jobs. Most people hate self-checkout lanes, by the way, but for some reason, uh, we keep talking about cashiers as a position that can 98, 99% chance of elimination. Uh, but that kind of brings to mind a, a very important point. Even though technology theoretically can do something, doesn't mean that we as society or we as people actually will accept it. A lot of us prefer talking to a cashier when we're at the checkout uh, link. We don't want to do the job of a cashier ourselves and have to scan 30 things at the grocery store. Why am I doing this and I'm not getting paid? 
So if you're going to make me scan everything, give me five dollars or give me a discount on uh, what I'm doing. So I mean, that's kind of an example of where the technology exists. Theoretically, a lot of big retailers could get rid of all cashiers tomorrow, uh, but they've discovered cashiers also play a valuable role in preventing shoplifting, uh, which isn't something that really you would think about, but it's like far more likely that somebody won't scan a couple of items when they're doing it themselves, but if you're handing everything to a cashier, obviously she, she or he is going to scan all the items and you don't have the kind of jump in shoplifting or uh, losses due to theft. So again, technology can do a lot of things, but will we want it to do all the things it could possibly do? That's a totally different um, issue. A lot of you are probably familiar with the notion of the gig economy. I mean, kind of a classic example of that is the Uber, Airbnb type of platform economy where I can get a car, uh, come to me, I can watch on my smartphone where it is, and it's a regular person just like you. It's not a trained professional cab driver uh, doing that job. Uh, and a lot of people predict that increasingly going forward, we're going to have, again, less full-time jobs and many more gig workers, somebody who's driving for Uber for 10 or 15 hours a week, maybe they're delivering food for another 15 hours a week, maybe they're doing some tutoring on the side, maybe they help somebody out with gardening or whatever, but they're, they're stringing together multiple gigs to make their ends uh, meet. And some studies actually say that up to 70% of these types of workers prefer that type of work. They like the flexibility, they don't have a boss, they can set their own hours. If I don't feel like working on a Friday or a Saturday, I don't have to. I can just turn off the app and I don't have to do anything that day. Uh, I would actually argue that number is probably overstated because a lot of those gig workers don't factor into that equation. Am I getting health benefits? Am I saving for my retirement? Do I have any kind of long-term financial stability? They're more looking at kind of the short term. I'm getting quick cash and I can work when um, I want. So I mean, when you start prompting people, how, how about your retirement? Are you putting money away for that? Uh, it's a different question. You might see those number, that number of 70% probably shrink down quite um, a bit. So now I just want to touch on kind of briefly, what's the impact of all of these changes for society? So I mean, number one, increased uncertainty. And I just kind of walked you through those job projection numbers, and they're all over the map, and they're from very reputable institutions. So do we trust Oxford? Do we trust McKinsey? Do we trust the World Bank? Do we trust the OECD? I mean, if I'm a politician or a senior civil servant in the government, I probably don't know what uh, to do. And what happens when we're unsure about something? Generally, we don't do anything. We kind of wait and see. So if you're driving on a foggy road, unless you have a death wish, you don't accelerate. You kind of wait and see what happens when the road clears up, and then I'll make my decision about which way um, am I going? So uncertainty is a challenge for governments. What should they do about these potential changes? And maybe these things won't happen. Maybe everything will be exactly as it is going um, for it. The pace of change is a significant issue. I'll talk about that uh, in a second. And I think really I mean, kind of the bigger underlying issue is we're entering this state of constant disruption, uncertainty, and volatility, which is really creating a lot of anxiety um, for people. It's stressful not knowing if the job I've trained my whole life for might disappear in five years. And what happens if that occurs? Where do I turn? How do I start making a living? How do I support um, my family? So in terms of, again, a pace of disruption issue. So um, in 1881, half of Canadians lived and worked on farms. Um, today, that number is under 2%. But that was a 140-year slow, steady decline of people moving from rural communities and farms into cities, into the suburbs, working in the service sector, working in manufacturing, etc., etc. So that gave society, that gave people generations to adapt to change. This wasn't a sudden, overnight uh, switch. Farming is still an important part of the economy. I, absolutely it is, but we don't need nearly as many people working on farms anymore. Why is that? Largely because of technology. We don't need hundreds or dozens of people picking the fields or preparing fields for crops. We have machines that can do that. The point here being, again, 140 year decline, technology can shift that decline from 140 years to five years or to 10 years. So I mean, the example I have here at the bottom of the slide is uh, how many Canadians drive for a living? 500,000 currently drive for a living day, so bus driver, subway, school bus, whatever you name it. 
Uh, you've probably already seen the videos on the news of self-driving cars being tested by companies like Google, uh, in places like Arizona and California. We're starting to test them actually even in Toronto. Uh, I think Stratford is testing some um, as well. But theoretically, uh, those cars could be quite prevalent in another five or ten years. What happens to the 45-year-old bus driver for the city of Burlington who loses their job because of self-driving bus? Uh, what do you train that person for? What do they do for the next 20 years of their life? They've only been a bus driver for 20 or 25 years. And there's no growth in other driving-related occupations. Technology will just slowly start taking those up. And again, that might happen, it might not happen. We don't know for a fact. But the possibility exists that the number of driving jobs in Canada will fall off a cliff in relatively the blink of an eye compared to something like the slow decline uh, of agricultural jobs. Uh, so this one's a little hard to see, but basically this shows you uh, the, tr the training challenge issue. So all governments, when they talk about this issue, the point they keep coming back to is, well, don't worry, we'll train people for new occupations, and that will kind of smooth out this issue of disruption. So the 45-year-old bus driver, we will train for a new occupation, and he or she will be fine, and they'll have something else to do. Uh, this shows you how much money governments spend as a share of their economy on public training. So Canada is about seventh from the bottom on this list. So about one sixth, one seventh the amount of spending as countries like Denmark uh, and Finland. So easy to say we're going to train our way out of this problem, but if we're not spending enough money on training, uh, that's probably not going to happen. But, I mean, the other issue is the effectiveness of our training programs is very poor. You look at programs like Employment Ontario here in the province, uh, you're talking about roughly 10 or 15 percent of people who go through that program land a full-time job paying as much as the job they had lost. Uh, so 80, 85, 90 percent are landing in lower paying, uh, lower quality uh, jobs. So again, the more people that are disrupted out of certain sectors or industries, how do we help them get a path into another uh, well-paying or equally well-paying um, opportunity. Uh, so what does this all mean in terms of jobs of the future? So I mean I mentioned, not everything that can be automated will be automated. A very clear example of this uh, is healthcare, uh, nursing, uh, long-term care homes. Technically speaking, uh, and in some com countries like Japan, they're actually moving very aggressively on this front, you have uh, Robocare. So you kind of have robots that will come into somebody's room who's a senior or needs some assistance. Um, I thought this audience might like this example. My dad doesn't like this example when I give it to him. Uh, I say, if you're not nice to me, I'm going to put you in a robocare. Um, so it's like, they can both vacuum your floor and spit out food pellets for you to eat. Um, but you can imagine, for a lot of us, we don't want our parents being taken care of by robots. We'd rather have a person giving you that human touch in that setting. Why is Japan different? Because they don't have, um, and, and they have basically zero immigration, and their population is very significantly aging. So they don't have the young people to come in and work in those types of uh, positions. So they have to turn to technology out of necessity. In Canada, we probably won't be in that exact same situation, but also education. I mean, do you want your grandkids, your kids being taught by a computer or just staring at a screen all day? Uh, probably not. Theoretically, you could probably get away with saying, well, half of the school day will be videos and kind of ro robot-guided uh, instruction, but most parents would say, no, I want a teacher in the classroom. It's more social. It's kind of more human. That's what I would um, prefer. But again, there are going to be new jobs, certainly in kind of the development and maintenance of these technologies. I mean, even if we have self-driving cars, somebody's got to maintain those cars. And it's going to be probably more complicated than an internal combustion engine. Uh, you're going to need some kind of technology background to figure out how do I fix a self-driving car. So I mean, there are going to be jobs growing in those types of fields, uh, for sure. Let me think about skills more generally. Uh, I mean, one, one area is certainly social and emotional intelligence. I mean, if we're thinking about what do we want our young people to have that differentiates them from computers, from robots, uh, it's social and emotional intelligence. Although, I mean, and again, my, so my wife's a clinical psychologist, and she is very much on the age of, well, no, no robot can take my job, but there are actually studies showing that 
some people open up more to a robot. So kind of like, uh, she really doesn't like hearing this, but um, people who have gone through like PTSD and other forms of trauma, they actually feel safer opening up about what happened to them to a robot than they would to a human uh, therapist. So again, even some of these things I'm saying, there, there are caveats and there might be exceptions uh, to this. But I think one thing almost everybody agrees on is uh, adaptability, lifelong learning will be increasingly important. You're not really going to come out of high school or college or university and have one 45-year career in one field anymore. The vast majority of people will be bouncing between many, many uh, jobs over the course of their lifetime. So the ability to learn, bounce back from, off, from a setback, uh, and, and get into a new field is going to be very um, important. Uh, so I want to touch on policy areas that need modernization. So we wrote a report about this particular issue three years ago, so it's called Working Without the Net. We basically looked at our employment insurance system, child care, uh, health care, housing, employment standards, and asked the question, if all of these changes happen, are these policy pro and program areas in Canada fit to the task of, uh, of helping people uh, kind of thrive in this era of disruption? Basic answer was Forget about the future, they're not even up to the task today, uh, let alone what have happened in 10 or 20 years. So I mean, if you look at a program like employment insurance, you're out of your job. Most of us would expect that if I lose my job through no fault of my own, I'm laid off, my industry is downsizing or shifting, I'd be eligible for EI. Unfortunately, less than 40% of unemployed Canadians are actually eligible for EI. That number used to be over 80% as recently as 1991, 1992. Uh, and guess what? If you're not eligible for the federal EI program, you're also not eligible for a lot of the skills training programs the federal government offers through provinces and third party service providers, which is actually quite counterintuitive. You would think if I lose my job and I'm not getting EI, at the very least I should get some skills training to help me find a new uh, position, but that's really not, um, not the case. Uh, I mean, the statistics around things like how many Canadians have saved for retirement are quite well known. I mean, roughly half of Canadians haven't even started saving for their retirement. Uh, I mentioned kind of the non-standard slash precarious workers in Ontario. Over 80% of them don't get extended benefits like vision, pharmacare, uh, Etc. Uh, child care, fewer than a quarter of uh, kids under the age of five uh, would have access to regulated child care spaces in Canada. Perhaps. So what can government, what can business, what can individuals do about all of these things? So this, a lot of this is pulled from a report we wrote last year called Race to the Top. So if you're interested, you can, you can look it up on our, on our website. But basically we looked at two very broad buckets of policy options for both government, business, individuals, and stakeholders. So the first we call pre-distribution. So this is kind of market-shaping type of behavior. So kind of small changes or tweaks that don't involve radical taxation hikes or anything like that that could have significant um, benefits to workers uh, and to Canadians more broadly. So an example of this for skills and education is uh, we could have something called more, more of a, an emphasis on what we call badging. So maybe I don't have the time or inclination to go through a full apprenticeship to become uh, a master tradesperson, a plumber, or an electrician, or whatnot. But maybe I could get badged as somebody who has a kind of special skill and I've been certified by an accredited group to install doors in uh, new condo developments or new housing developments. So I don't have kind of the full suite of skills I need to do everything on a trade site or on a, on a work site, but I've been certified, I can install doors or I can have, I have a very particular thing that I have been certified I can do. That would benefit people tremendously because they don't have to then prove to each employer, each job they go to that I can do this. You've already been accredited, I can just bring you on board knowing you can do this and I can trust you with this. Uh, job. When we think about wages, I mean, how do you help people negotiate better wages? One very simple way is transparency. If I'm getting a job offer at a new firm, it helps me significantly to know how much are my co-workers making at that firm. Because if I get a low-ball offer, I can go back to the employer and say, you know what, everybody else is making $35 an hour, why are you only offering me $27 an hour? That's not fair. Uh, and we've seen this work in countries like Norway. So in Norway, 
you can actually access everybody's income tax information and see how much they make. Uh, so has had huge impacts on uh, wages, especially at the bottom end of the wage distribution. What they had a challenge with was a lot of very nosy people looking online and spying on how much are my neighbors making, how much are these people I need at this event today making, you go home and you kind of type in everybody's name and make a note. So what they did was they actually put a little check into their system. Now you can still look at how much I make, but there will be a notation for me saying, you looked at how much I made. They saw a dramatic drop off in the number of stupid uh, people. So very important human nature lesson that we are very nosy, but if we know somebody knows that we're being nosy, we'll pretend that we don't care uh, at all about something. But I mean, that's a very simple thing governments can nudge larger firms to be transparent about your wages. It doesn't even have to be at the level of, I know your name, it could be by position type. So a director or a senior person at this firm on average makes X, and then other people joining the firm can kind of negotiate based on those uh, terms. I mean, public infrastructure or federal and provincial municipal governments are spending a huge amount of money maintaining and building new infrastructure in the coming years. One thing that governments can do to help particularly disadvantaged groups, so young people maybe from communities who don't have a lot of economic opportunity, is tie some of that infrastructure funding to opportunities for people in the communities where the infrastructure is being built. So in Toronto, for example, uh, Metrolinx is building the Eglinton Crosstown LRT, so right across the kind of center of the city. Uh, and they've developed some community benefit agreements with kids from um, underprivileged neighborhoods to allow them access to uh, skilled apprenticeships. So you can kind of get your foot in the door. If you're doing a good job, you're going to be making 70, 80, 90,000 dollars a year by the time you're 25, 26, um, 27. It's kind of harnessing public spending to help boost opportunity um, for people. Uh, and then the other big, the other big bucket we looked at was uh, redistribution. So it's kind of classically what you think about if we've got a challenge with uh, not enough services or not enough programs, why don't we tax those with more money and redistribute that uh, tax revenue to uh, a national pharmacare program, a national child care program, uh, more services through Medicare for mental health issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so I mean, the challenge here is uh, we are anchored by our location. Uh, north of the United States. I mean, they obviously have very low taxes, very entrepreneurial society. Uh, Canadian governments are, I would say, very afraid of raising taxes too far out of step with the US, because the fear is that our companies or high wealth individuals will just move then um, south. So I mean, I think we kind of think of ourselves as a European nation in terms of how progressive and uh, socially inclusive we are, but we are really actually held back by our proximity to the U.S. in that regard. I mean, obviously there are huge benefits to being close to the U.S. in terms of trade and economic opportunity, uh, but when it comes to taxing uh, corporations and citizens at a relatively fair rate to generate social programs, we're quite far behind. I mean, we're 25th out of 35 advanced economies in terms of our overall tax uh, burden. Uh, I mean, we can also experiment in terms of these types of transfers or public expenditures with things like a guaranteed annual income or a basic income. You may recall this is one of the other things the Ford government canceled the pilot on, so I think Hamilton was one of the test sites for uh, that. And that's something a lot of people talk to in this future of work conversation. So if we don't have enough jobs for people, let's provide them with kind of a, a basic living allowance where they can take care of their needs uh, and make sure they can pay for food, shelter, uh, etc. I would actually probably argue that's not the right answer in a world where there's not enough work to go around because I mean the challenge there is going to be who's going to pay for that? I mean if you've got fewer and fewer people working, you can only tax them so much before they will move somewhere. I also mean the answer probably is more in social programs, like let's provide people with affordable housing, childcare options, and then they can string together some jobs in the private sector to make ends. Uh, meet. But if, I only, if I'm giving you $2,000 a month in a city like Toronto, I mean, that will maybe cover your rent, and then what do you do for food, energy, your internet bill, uh, and everything? So I mean, I, I'm skeptical about whether that would be the answer in the longer, longer term. But I do think it was something worth experimenting with. It's unfortunate the experiment got um, 
chance. So all the same, there's lots of kind of challenges in this space, lots of opportunity. Uh, Canada's not the only country going through these issues. I mean, this is something all countries around the world are thinking about. I mean, one thing I didn't even talk about here was um, what this will mean for developing economies. So countries in places like Africa and Asia, because you've got a lot of workers who are going to be very highly skilled uh, in those countries, especially places like China and India, who are going to be coming into the global labor market. And soon, you're, we're already in the world, but soon it'll be much more prevalent where a lawyer in India can bid on a job online for, from a firm in Canada. So if I'm a Canadian lawyer or an accountant or a banker, all of a sudden I'm not just competing with other Canadians or other Americans, I'm competing with very highly skilled people whose wages are much lower uh, in other countries. So I mean, we could very well see kind of a flattening of global wages, so people in developing countries moving up the ladder and people in places like Canada uh, struggling to get further uh, ahead. So I mean, all really challenging, interesting questions, definitely something governments are thinking about, and we talked to a lot of governments about this uh, in Canada and abroad, and I would say the general consensus is we don't know quite what to do and we really need to figure this out quickly because I mean it's a challenge and it's only going to kind of come at us faster. So thank you and I'll see you soon.